Hello and welcome to the Game Design for Student Success webinar, uh, our continuing series on game design principles to be applied to higher education. And today's webinar is going to be on non-zero sum game design. This is a um, attempted rebroadcast. We were supposed to do this yesterday and we had some technical difficulties. So this, um, this series is, uh, this is the fourth webinar in a nine part, part series. So as I indicated, we'll be talking about non-zero sum game design today. I'm Candace Best, your presenter. Before we go any further, just a reminder, as I said at the top, this is actually being recorded um, and will be disseminated out to, to our audience um, of subscribers for this webinar. I went ahead and recorded it so we could could get it out. Um, so I, I thank you for your patience in that regard. Um, as always, please invite your colleagues to register so that they can get rebroadcasts like this one um, and be alerted of um, our next webinar, which we will get back on our regular schedule uh, next week. Post questions and comments below. Again, if you're viewing this from our broadcast page, that is persistent. So you can come and post questions and comments at any time. If you are registered, you will have that URL. Um, obviously, we're not going to be doing any live tweeting today because it's anticipated that this is not uh, going to be viewed live by very many people because we didn't do an announcement. But um, you can certainly tweet at whatever time you're watching it if uh, you find some topics that are interesting. And because we actually are doing this as a, um, as a um, not previously announced webinar, Brooklyn Bingo will not apply to this particular webinar, but check back when we resume our um, previously scheduled weekly webinars, which will uh, again be next week so that you can participate in Brooklyn Bingo. All right, so we're going to get started with the objectives for today are to describe non-zero sum or also known as co-op or collaborative game design. Uh, we're going to go through the seven rules for cooperative game design and then talk about how, as we do with each of our webinars, we uh, apply this to educational use cases. Today, though, we're going to talk specifically, we're going to use it our College Core product as our case study. As I mentioned in the kickoff, uh, we were going to use that in many instances. So you're going to get a chance to see how we're using not only the rules of co-op game design, but also the basic principles, those six simple machines, the game design for student success model that we've covered. Uh, I'm going to tie all of that together and show you exactly how we apply it and are using it in uh, preparation for the launch of College Core later this summer. We will talk about game mechanics for the first time. So we've been focusing on game design and I distinguish game design from game mechanics when we had our kickoff. Um, but today we're gonna finally actually talk about game mechanics because that's a key part of um, how you actually make game design work. So we'll talk about those, we'll go over the game mechanics, um, the ones that support and the ones that hinder a, a co-op or collaborative game design approach. So first, let's start off with what is non-zero-sum game and the best non-zero-sum game design. And the best way to do that is to distinguish it from zero-sum. So a zero-sum game is what we traditionally think about any kind of competitive game. It's a win-lose state. Someone has to lose for someone to win. That's a zero-sum game. So when we talk about non-zero-sum games, so we see an example like chess or checkers, uh, any kind of competitive ga game. When we talk about non-zero-sum game, then we're talking about games that are win-win. Everyone who plays can win. No one has to lose. This is an example that I found off the internet of a dancing game. I think it's based out of Australia uh, to encourage kids to dance. So they have all of these steps. If you've played rock band or there, there are dancing games you can even find in arcades or at home where you're... Um, you're being challenged to do something. There may be steps on the screen that you have to follow. I'm not familiar with all of the details of this move dancing game, but in the videos, it's basically um, having students take steps and move in different directions. So there are some of the elements, there are rules um, that are similar to what is what we expect of a game, but students are not competing with each other. They're actually completing that game together. They're having fun together. And that's what makes non-zero sum games different and appealing, and you'll see in a second 
why they're particularly well suited for our educational objectives. So why non-zero sum? It's cooperative, it's collaborative. Players achieve together. There's really no downside to structuring an, ob an educational objective under those um, conditions. It's, it's only beneficial in part because it distributes both the pain and the gain. So when um, when players, or in this case, students have to labor through something, but they do it together, they share the burden. There's that saying a burden shared is a burden halved. So it makes it a little easier. They understand that they're not going through it alone. Uh, so whenever you can put particularly something difficult in a setting where, where participants get to do that together, it, it lessens the burden and the, the load of, of doing it. And when we talk about four types of fun, which is a um, is one of the webinars we'll be doing in a couple of weeks as a part of this series, we'll come back to that issue of hard fun and people fun and how when people have fun together, it's much more impactful. Um, but also it's the best parts of competition without the worst parts. So a non-zero sum game can still be competitive. Right, so if you've ever played one of those games, like the dancing games or the uh, or rock band, and they're giving you something to do, you can get as excited and as frustrated and as motivated as you would when you're competing against someone. But you don't have those negative um, aspects of having to force someone to lose or yourself being on the losing end um, when you remove that head-to-head -head competition. You know, I'm not saying that head to head competition doesn't have its place. It does, obviously it's not going away, but we're focusing on the benefits in this webinar and the appealing aspects of thinking about game design from a non-zero point of view. So let's go over the seven rules. These come from Dr. Amy Jo Kim. Uh, I should, as a side note, say that as I, uh, am ac I actually interviewed Dr. Amy Jo Kim for our podcast, Genius Cafe, so I, encourage you to check it out on YouTube or Stitcher or any of the places where you, if you listen to podcasts, would you find them? We're on Google Play, we're in a number of areas. It's Genius Cafe, but we just did a really great interview with her. We didn't talk about the seven rules of game design, but we did get her perspective on game design and its application to, to education. So um, a quick plug for that, highly recommend checking that podcast out, episode out. But her rules are, um, the seven rules for what it takes to create a co-op game design are one, compete with the system, two, you have shared goals and outcomes, three, independent, interdependent roles, four, rituals and social gestures, five, shared resources, six, non-zero sum types of stats and spotlights, and seven, you want user-generated content. So we're going to go through each of those rules one by one and talk about them in the context of education. So let's start with compete with the system. And I've underlined and put in italics with, because I want to emphasize that in some respects, that rule is saying that instead of competing against someone, you're competing against the system itself. And that is clearly an element of cooperative game design. But I also want to encourage you to think of it in our context of education as competing alongside the system so that you you can position, you can use game design and you can use a non-zero sum or cooperative approach to get the benefits of co cooperation without even think, seeing the system, in this case, education or the class as the enemy or as the competitor. And I think it's important to think of it in those terms. So if we look at it that way as both, sometimes we are competing against the system, sometimes we're competing with, as in alongside the system, that's when we think about milestone markers and challenges that are just designed to move the student forward, but not designed to make the student feel like that the school, the class, the assignment is, is against them. So how do we do that? One of the things to, to think about that I think bears some discussion is is grades. And, uh, you know, Amy Jo Kim talks about this in the podcast about how the incentives that you provide directly impact what you're motivating players to do or not to do. And I'm going to, you know, in our podcast series later, we're going to actually have two episodes of the podcast later in um, in a few weeks just talking about great less environments. But I do wanna raise it here because 
grades do create a competitive environment where the student actually believes that they're competing against the system. And in many instances, in many respects, it's just counterproductive. We'll see that shortly as we go further through and we get to game mechanics. So what I would say is uh, think about ways that you can shift the focus away from scores. Even in many of us are in institutions where we don't have the option not to grade, we have to turn a grade in, but there are ways to go grade list with, even within a grading environment. And again, there'll be a later, uh, I'm sure I'll do a later webinar on just that point, but just keep that in mind because there are lots of resources that you can check out um, to start giving, start getting you to think about ways to remove the grading focus from education. And that absolutely, I believe, is consistent with the first rule. Group project goals is, is one way to do that. So the group is thinking about achieving something as opposed to the individual. Assignment menus is an example of something. It's somewhat gamified. It's some, something that I've used um, in the past. And then grade petitions refers to, and this goes directly with grade lists, um, going grade lists in your teaching environment. Grade petitions means that you put the onus on the student to petition or to, to make a presentation for why they should earn the grade they think they should earn. Now you do this with criteria. Um, I, we have something that, that I developed called verti vertical rubrics to support this, this model. And again, that goes beyond the scope of this particular webinar to get into detail. But the broader idea of having the student take more ownership of how their grade will be determined, giving them parameters uh, within which to frame their petition um, is, is very much in line with competing with the system. So it, it starts to remove the whole, um, I have to, you know, I don't have really control over what happens with my grade. If as an educator, how many times have we heard this? You gave me this grade, you gave me that grade. I always tell students, I don't give you anything. This is what you earned. But if you can shift the way in which students interact, the students see assessment, the way they engage with their material, and then they the way repositioning the role that assessment plays in their relationship with the content you're trying to share with them, now you're starting to move to competing alongside the system. The competition is we're moving to mastery. That's, that's remember that's the basic rule of game design, moving your players to mastery. So everything that we do, whether it's a macro goal of graduation or a micro goal of just, you know, getting through this particular course and being confident in the subject matter, we're still trying to move them to mastery and maintaining that position is, you know, part and parcel of competing with the system. The next is shared goals and outcomes. So here's where we can start to move towards more intrinsic motivators versus the extrinsic motivators of points and, and things that we actually are gonna cover today, um, but that we talked about before, especially in our last webinar on progression, that we wanted to try to move towards having your player invest and have an intrinsic motivator for moving forward. So this is where meaning and purpose comes from. Creating shared goals and outcomes supports a group identity, the sense of collective accomplishment. So you want to incorporate a sense of belonging. So here is where this is an element of cooperative game design that will hopefully resonate for programs that are thinking about how do I incorporate game design into a maybe an, uh, maybe a major. You know, you want students maybe to have a sense of identity with being a part of this major and therefore participating in activities outside of the classroom. That might be one example. So you create goals that are dependent upon groups of students working together. Civic service projects is an example, but you can also do it in the course environment. You can certainly create group assignments that strongly encourage, maybe even require students to work together and achieve a goal collectively. And over a period of time, the process of working together and having the shared outcome creates a sense of belonging, group identity, gives a sense of meaning and purpose that all are essential to introducing intrinsic motivation, intrinsic motivations into your design. Related to that is interdependent roles. Um, so as you are encouraging students to work together, and that's that's an that's a through line for all of this. Cooperative game design means we want players to cooperate, to work together. Um, the two elements of that, I think, when we talk about inter 
dependent roles that you want to think about deliberately. Deliberately, one is positioning it as a way of leveraging individual expertise. In other words, letting students know or start to think about the specific talents that they have and that they can contribute and the benefits to finding other talents. And that's what I mean by hidden leadership. One of the most underappreciated, I heard this at a, at a uh, workshop I attended once and I thought it was one of the most powerful statements on leadership I had ever heard. One of the most underappreciated forms of leadership is recognizing talent in others. So if we can design the interactions in whatever game we're creating or gamified experience we're creating so that we encourage students to see working together as highlighting their individual strengths, but, but also rewarding and encouraging them to identify and support the strengths of their teammates and um, you know, becoming proficient in articulating the strengths they see in others, that's an excellent skill. That's an excellent transferable skill um, that helps to prepare our students for life outside of a classroom. So part and parcel of that is positioning individual ability as a puzzle piece, that there are objectives that need to be achieved that are just not going to be achieved um, completely or well if we try to do it alone. This is a really important um, issue that I think that we, we could probably do more work on, especially when we're talking about uh, students who are at higher risk for non-completion in higher ed, students who are who come into college under-resourced or underprepared. A very common uh, condition, a very common phenomenon that we see with those students is this what I call the lone wolf syndrome. They don't ask for help. They don't want to do group projects. They come on campus to go to class. They leave. They try to complete college completely by themselves, which is a uh, you know a really great way to do poorly. Um, college is a team sport, you need help. And so by thinking about ways to overcome that tendency in students, uh, we do have to get creative in, in how we present the value of working collaboratively. And so this individual ability as puzzle piece is just another way of um, conceptualizing for students the importance of understanding that, you know, most projects that you work on are going to require the cooperation and the input of different perspectives. You have a perspective or you have an ability that's going to be important, but just like it's not a puzzle if it's only one piece, um, what you're working on is going to require multiple pieces. The guild model refers to opportunities to include task-based or uh, skill-building activity. So a uh, project-based learning uh, is, comes to mind immediately. But if you can create an identity around that project-based learning, and this is something that was mentioned in an, another podcast up interview that we've got coming up uh, on our podcast with Scott Ranke talked about how that was something that got him back interested in college was when he was introduced to the same college that he had attended and, and dropped out of twice. The third time was the charm because he was reintroduced to it through a project-based learning experience. And so they call it a guild model, which is you're working on something practical, you're developing a proficiency, a certification in that, and that gives you an identity associated with your ability to do that particular thing. I think there are huge opportunities for us to bring more of that into higher education. And then third is interdependent roles, um, credentialed caring. I love that term it was introduced to me. This notion that we actually make explicit and reward explicitly students who help each other. And it doesn't have to be as formal as coaching or tutoring. It can just be you know, buddying up to get through a challenging experience. These are all different examples of what it means to have inter interdependent ro roles, excuse me. And there are numerous opportunities to do this that um, we may not have thought about, but this is a great point if you if you've been sticking with us and thinking about how to apply game design principles to your objectives thinking explicitly about how you can make the activities and the roles that students play for each other interdependent is is again it's a rule of, of cooperative game design and a very valuable tool in making your game design approach more uh, engaging and more meaningful for your participants 
co-ops and rituals, uh, social gestures. So social gestures, we're thinking primarily of something that happens on an application, you know, on, on a mobile app or on a game. So I can upvote you, your comment on our communication thread, or I can like something that you posted. But, you know, you can create those things in a physical environment with, with stickers and pins. Think about the cords and sashes we give to graduates if they've achieved a milestone like being on the Dean's List. All of those are uh, public gestures, public recognition of achievement. And just like graduation is a ritual, we have those every year because we recognize that having some sort of public way of recognizing progress is extremely meaningful. We don't have to wait until the student has graduated to have rituals. Um, they benefit, they they help by promoting bonding and belonging, noting progress. So I use the example of service ladders, which I'll talk about um, again shortly. But the idea is, again, if we're thinking back to the previous rule, if we're going to deliberately create opportunities for students to be interdependent and to work together, we want to note that that's valuable in a public way. And if we can create rituals or public gestures that acknowledge and celebrate it, we reinforce that this is something valuable and something that is worth it for students to continue to participate in. So again, think of our progression. These are some tactical ways that we encourage investment and therefore encourage progression. Shared resources. So what we're talking about here is tangible connectedness. Is there something physical or something tangible that you can encourage students or can require them to share? Right. So in the game sense, it may be some future privilege is unlocked if you work together to share resources to accomplish something. Um, multiply rewards. So you can give, um, you can add to the value of a reward or a privilege or, or something that you're sharing that you're providing to your participants if they co collaborate to use it. Right. So they get more power or it gets more. Um, meaningful if they're working together. And again, I'll give examples of this when we get to the case study. I threw sca scavenger hunts in here just because it to me is the most easily identifiable example of, you know, sort of a shared resource, shared task activity. If you've ever participated in a scavenger hunt, it is, um, it's, it's, it's really kind of ridiculous how much fun it is, <laughs> but it is central. One, there's no such thing really as a scavenger hunt by yourself. I mean, I guess you, it could be done, but if you've ever done them, there's so much more fun when teams go out together. And the, so the shared resources in that example is, you know, the ability for several people on the team to be looking for an item or to be approaching what needs to be accomplished. Because again, the, I've seen some really creative scavenger hunts. Some are, you've got to go find something, but some are also, you've got to figure out a clue. And so the idea of sharing your intellectual resources to figure out how to move forward a scavenger hunt is a is a great uh, example of that. And if there are ways to apply that same um, strategy to something that you want to encourage students to do, uh, it's, a, it's a great idea and it's a great example of a shared resource. And then finally, using resource constraints as a strategy. So hub and choke points, what that means is if there are already times or places where you're going, students are going to be forced to bottleneck or forced to congregate, um, so think, for example, of orientation. You've got all students coming on the first week anyway. You've got their full attention or they, you know, you've got a certain week that something has to be done and so students are going to be lined up. Are there opportunities for you to leverage, right? You've got a limited resource. The limited resource may be time. It may be staff and engagement. It may be any number of things and hubs and chunk points are good representations of those opportunities where by definition, it means we have a resource constraint. How can you use that deliberately? So in other words, if they're already going to be waiting online for something, is there an opportunity for us to then use that as a part of our a strategy or an element of our, our game designed um, initiative or project or program? So is there some way that we can use that as maybe the discovery loop, it, incorporate that into the discovery loop or the first contact loop? So again, it's just thinking in terms of leveraging opportunities that you have if if students or participants are already together and see how you can turn that from a constraint into a positive. And if you remember, that's one of our simple machines is constraint is the wedge, right? So you can turn the wedge into an incline plane if you, if you reposition it. 
if that will mean if that didn't that if that term didn't mean anything to you, then go back and watch our kickoff <laughs> webinar. Um, the next is non-zero stats and spotlights. So what we're talking about here is again recognition, but being very deliberate about what you recognize. If you're just recognizing individual achievement, and you'll see this in a second when we talk about leaderboards, then that can often have a very chilling effect on the motivation of everyone else who couldn't be number one or couldn't even get on the leaderboard. Um, it is important to recognize effort, however. So if someone really overcame a challenge or they made improvement, those are the kinds of things that um, actually are great to spotlight. So recognize individual effort, but what we really wanna do is celebrate group, group achievements. And if you're gonna have a leaderboard, have the leaderboard represent groups instead of individuals, that's all non-zero sum. So you wanna, in other words, we already talked about zero sum versus non-zero sum. What we wanna do is just recognize any kind of non-zero zero sum types of activities. So, uh, you know, the department or the, the, the residence hall that had the most volunteer hours or gave the most to charity, those are all non-zero sum type of activities you definitely want to support them because, again, you're showcasing what matters and it's sending a message about what's value. And finally, user-generated content is the single best way to get investment into your experience. You want your participants to be authors of wherever possible of the content that you're also trying to get them to consume. You know, we tend to care about what we create. So you want to encourage that. It promotes creativity. It deepens the investment, but most importantly, and I think I've made that point here, if not, I've, I've made it so many times I've lost track, but um, this term, not about me, without me, actually comes from the, dis the disability community, but I think it is so relevant also to the work we do in higher ed. We spend a lot of time focusing on how can we help students improve their persistence and completion, and very often it's a bunch of you know, adult educators, I should say, pro staff, professionals who've already completed that process, making decisions about what will help the students without actually including them in helping to create the solution. So include them, let them be a part of that. That's all user-generated content, even if it's just get their suggestions and then acknowledge that this idea or suggestion came from a student, came from a participant. That's a form of user-generated content and it is a huge, huge motivator for continued participation. So with that, let's talk about mechanics. We've been, I've been hinting at that for, since we started this series, uh, let's talk about what that really looks like. And we're gonna do that by jumping into a College Core case study. So as I said, we're launching College Core um, and everything about how we've been designing it has been based on uh, game design principles. So what you're looking at is the dashboard. Just by way of reminder, College Core is a professional network for college students that develops career-ready skills through service. So what we want to do in applying game design principles is we want to, you'll see in the middle, we have challenges and it's graphically represented in a way that lets students know where they're progressing, um, list challenges that they can take on, um, again, competing with the system. So it's not listing, hey, you're the number one. It's saying these are things that you can do to improve yourself. And there are also opportunities for you to work with others to do that. So the way we do, uh, we are introducing this concept of tr using service as career training is through what we call professional development communities. And we have four, one focused on civic service. So that's service with your peers to the community, Two, prep core and roadman graduate is service to your peers. So students helping other students to achieve their academic goals. And then the STEAM teams is a professional community where we want to encourage students to start working together with students from different majors to solve problems. So that's the basic model. The challenge we have in College Core as the challenge you have um, when starting anything new is how do we introduce students to this? So this is a reminder of our game design for student success model. We know that, as I mentioned uh, in our last webinar on progression, all students start out as, you know, that lower left quadrant of flow is apathy, right? So we always, our last uh, webinar, if you missed that, please check that out. Always remember that when you're introducing something new, you're starting at a level of apathy. They don't know what they're supposed to do. They don't know why they are supposed to do it and assume they don't even care. So our standard progression arc, our template is, okay, we start with discovery. We have to think about how are they gonna discover this? 
and discover that this is something that they should try. Um, the best way to do this is to be very deliberate about who and how that first contact with the experience happens and that that first contact facilitates teaching them how to make use of whatever it is you're, you're gamifying, whatever it is you're introducing through a game designed approach. And that onboarding then moves them to a, a little bit more independence, hopefully uh, more self-initiated rather than external triggers. They're relying on internal triggers to continue to participate. So we have habit building and route to mastery. So that's our basic template for you know a basic progression arc in the game design for student success model. So what that meant for us is we had the same challenge. Our overall goal was we want to introduce college students to College Core. So we want to start with a minor arc, which is have them complete their first service project so they know what it feels like. It's one thing to say, hey, you can develop skills through service, but if we want to teach a new group of students to do that and not overwhelm them with a number of choices, then we we decided to start very deliberately. So the st Strive for 85, My Campus Votes project is we're having all of our, our first group of students work on the goal of getting to 85% voter participation among college students. So the discovery phase looks like this. We are gonna be training this summer, a group of students to be the, the leaders of this initiative when they go back to campus and encourage them to leverage their pre-existing student relationships word of mouth, because that's basically how um, it's the best way to introduce something new. Start with the people you're already talking to. So we're planning, what would be discovery? Well, the first group of students we train will be the ones who will help new students discover this idea by introducing it to them. The first contact when they get back to campus would be, and this goes back to the hub and chuck points I talked about, we'll be training the students. Start with existing events. Make your first contact places where students will already be, where they'll already be in a mindset about learning about something new, if it's, it's, if it's freshmen or students coming back, they're in that first frame of mind of, hey, how am I going to get myself situated this semester? That's a good time to make first contact about something that they want to do. But you also want to leverage your pre-existing network. So if there are already, again, relationships happening, um, use that. So think deliberately about your first contact. Then onboarding, is since we're talking about something very specific, and, and hopefully this will sound familiar from our earlier webinar series. Remember, we always talked about loops to make sure you have one objective at a time, one task, one engaging activity at a time. So for us, just like we, even though we have these four different professional development communities, we decided to start everyone off with this one community, this single purpose project, sole goal of, hey, we're just focusing on Improving voter turnout for the upcoming midterm election. It's a very clear ask. It's a very specific goal. And in all likelihood, there are, on most college campuses, there are probably existing campaigns working on something similar. So you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You can start to ease in and onboard through working with um, people who are already working on the, the same project. So onboarding would be integrating into existing civic service projects or existing campus voting initiatives, and then rolling this campaign into it to ease. Now, on a broader sense, by walking our first users through the broader goal of College Core by giving them a very specific set of tasks and steps, the same process that they're going to use to launch and be successful with this first so service project will be the same sequence of activities they can then apply. So we're, we're teaching them and they're practicing replicable, tra replicable transferable skill building activities that will then, once this campaign is done for the midterm and elections will be at November, then they will be in a position to then apply those same skills to other kinds of service projects that can help them build a career. So what I've just walked you through is the thought process of, you know, what would the loops look like for this project? How did we take something big? Like how do we introduce this big network to a bunch of students and reduce it to something very discreet? This is the same challenge that we'll be facing you when you decide, okay, what's our big goal? And then what's our first arc? How are we gonna take that big goal and break it into something small? and create little loops and link them together as we've talked about in the previous webinars in a way that will that has opportunity for investment but is not so overwhelming that that students drop out early so um, again the just to now tie it to our seven steps of co-op design how are they competing with the system? Well, we have one goal. 
It's a voter engagement goal. Everybody's focused on the same thing. We want our campus to have 85% students who are eligible to vote, vote. Um, the shared goal is, you know, everybody working on the project is working towards that campus target. Again, so we're not competing, although we, we probably will encourage competing against campuses, but within each campus, the students are sharing that goal. Hey, how do we get our campus to get to that 85 number? Inter interdependent roles. Now, as a part of our training, Again, our, our overarching purpose of College Corps is to help students use service as career readiness training. Part of the challenge to that, though, is getting students to think, well, how do I serve? What are my skills? So we have this model that is part of the training that helps students start to think about, what, how would I best be able to serve? And we came up with really, you know, there's a whole quiz and there's training that we will be sharing with them that at the end, they'll start to see themselves as one of four types, amplifier, connector, organizer, creator. The purpose for that then will be, again, this is very much about not only service, but service together, project teams. And so one of the things that they're gonna be taught uh, in the training and then we'll share with their, with their classmates as they go back onto their campuses is that a successful team needs a, a mixture of people. So as you figure out that, hey, you know, I'm, I'm a great amplifier, I can help, you know, I can work with an organizer type to to create some goals and be able to move this project forward in this way. So we, we were thinking about very simple ways for students to identify. So remember we talked about not only interdependent roles, so recognizing that a good team is gonna have a mix of types, giving them easy to remember ways to identify types they can work together, um, but then also giving them an identity, which is something else that we talked about rituals and social gestures. So in our model, which we talked about in the previous, uh, I think in a previous episode, in a previous webinar, um, the service as career training is very much about also providing a progression ladder, right? A service ladder. So you develop skills, volunteering in one role, you take on responsibility, and then you move up in the hierarchy. This represents a ritual. Right, so this is this is part of the reason why we designed it this way, and this is one example that you can think about. Again, it gives it's it's some sort of visual marker. So on our platform, it would literally be a medallion that they can put on their profile to indicate, hey, I've achieved this rank, and now I'm moving up in rank. Um, and again, in the same platform, as students are communicating, they can use social gestures. But as I said, whether you're using something like a College Core platform or Facebook or you're just doing something on campus where people are wearing stickers or badges. These, all these social gestures are visual reminders that I'm a part of something, that I, it's a reminder to the student that, hey, I'm achieving something, I am moving to mastery. So shared resources in our example, as I said earlier, there are lots of organizations. I've listed a few, Campus Voter Project, Rock the Vote, uh, students Learn, Students Vote. There are a number of re the Andrew Goodman Project, Vote Everywhere. There are already a lot of resources. Uh, so we'll certainly be leveraging that. But in the process, we're also showing and teaching students that you don't have to create everything from scratch. Take advantage of resources or create resources and then share them with other people. So this is an example in a project that they're seeing what this looks like and how we have designed it deliberately to min mimic that. And then I mentioned earlier, that while you have shared goals and students can focus on their goal for their campus, an example of non-zero sum stats that we would incorporate is campus leaderboards. So you heard me say again, what we would not do is say, you know, internally students will know and be able to keep track of how many students they've recruited and signed up. But what we really want to celebrate is, you know, how are campuses doing? How are teams within campuses doing of bringing their students in, their classmates in and getting them registered and getting them to vote? And then we'll be able to promote and say, hey, these campuses are, you know, they're almost at their 85% goal. This, these campuses have had high rates of participation at their, uh, their voting events. Those are examples of non-zero sum stats that don't make any individual feel like they're, that, like they can't participate or that they're so far behind, there's no point of them even continuing. That's the problem you have with individual leaderboards. When you start highlighting an individual person, you're also reminding 10 other people that they, they may not ever be able to be successful, so why bother? As opposed to if your campus sees that, you know, you're ranked third and, and another campus is right above you, but you're close, or even if you're not close, you know you can make movements. This gives the students something to bond around. So this is our example. I'm sure you can think of a number of ways you could do this on your campus, different 
competitions that you can have across departments, across teams that create these bonding opportunities. And then you highlight those team-based accomplishments as a non-zero-sum step. And then finally, user-generated content, again, because our platform is very much set up like a, it's a social networking platform, students will be able to post within the platform, but then they can also share and post on their own social media accounts. They can do presentations, they can create posters. We would expect and encourage them to create a content for events. All of this deepens investment, all of it ties back to the goal, and all of it builds skill. So what are some other use cases? What are opportunities to do something similar related to your individual objectives? New student transfer student orientation obviously is, is one example. But I would also note that schools have underutilized opportunities to create rituals around transitioning from you know, sophomore to junior year. We often see schools that do really well with freshman retention don't have matching graduation rates, which means they're losing students later in the process. And often it's at that transition to upper class status when the classes get harder, when the demands are greater. And if you had an opportunity to transition students into that and you could use some of the principles we talked about today to help with that process, those are non-zero sum game design approaches are ideal for that, for the reasons that we mentioned. Fans Faculty sponsored projects are high impact practices. We know that through research. Uh, and yet we have so many students who don't, who don't engage in them because they don't think about it. So how can we apply a, a zero sum approach to encouraging students to work with their faculty on projects outside of a class assignment? But you can also apply this to in-class assignments, to encouraging students to take advantage of academic support services. There are so many ways in which the goals we have at, in higher ed, the goals we have for our students can be packaged not only into a game design model, which we've been talking about since the beginning, but now that you've been introduced to non-zero sum games and those rules, and hopefully the case study I shared show you how both the six simple machines, the loops, the arcs, the progression, and these rules of co-op gaming can work together to provide um, a series, a design scheme that you can apply to a wide range of goals. So that's it for this presentation. Again, I'm assuming that if you're watching this, you're probably going to be watching this not live, but in the replay, but you can still post comments. I encourage you to post your thoughts, questions, comments, ideas that you have about how you would apply it. Again, on our broadcast page, we actually have a game design. Um, we have a, um, hmm, I have to apologize. There are a, uh, I seem to have left out the slides on specific mechanics. For some reason, it is not showing up. So I will, uh, on the, on the leaderboard, you will, um, excuse me, on the broadcast page, you will see a handout for game design mechanics that has a lot of information on game mechanics, the different types of mechanics there are, and explains them. Um, I encourage you to take a look at that handout, post any questions that you have. I apologize for somehow that slide, those slides got left out of the presentation of the actual game mechanics. So I'll make sure that I uh, incorporate some comments about that into our next, um, our next webinar, which is gonna be on incorporating emotions. So emotions actually on that list, if you download our game mechanics cheat sheet, you'll see there's a whole uh, list of different emotions that are important. So I will make sure, my promise, that we will I will in incorporate the slide that somehow got left out, um, and and we will revisit game mechanics in detail when we talk about emotions in our next webinar, and definitely in the one after that when we talk about creating a narrative. So again, I thank you for attending, and look forward to um, revisiting our game design series with you next week in our next webinar.